The concept of binary patching is really important in the emulation communities. I mean, it's important in a lot of different places, but especially in emulation where people are creating ROM hacks and translations, it's really important to be able to take a, an opaque binary file, uh, mess around with it in a hex editor or more complicated tools, and sort of create uh, an encoding of the difference between those two things, because you expect your end users to actually have the original game and you can't actually distribute the original game in a legal way. So you kind of want to have something that allows that to happen. Now, in the previous video on this channel, we actually built an implementation of an IPS patcher. So IPS is a particular format. It's quite an old format. And we saw how it can be used to, to patch an original ROM. Now, the big problem with IPS, well, it actually has several big problems. <laughs> Uh, but some of the problems with IPS are the fact that it doesn't have any kind of identification of the original file, so you might accidentally patch something that isn't the thing you think you are patching. Um, it doesn't give you any d indication of the final size of the, of the patched binary, uh, which is a bit of a problem because it means that you kind of don't know how to upfront allocate memory for what you're building. Um, it has 24-bit numbers for everything. Well, actually, sometimes it uses 16-bit numbers for things, but it, the highest value that it can record is a 24-bit is a number, which is kind of severely limiting on the, uh, well, on the size of things that you can patch and, and how you can address uh, into a ROM, etc. And it doesn't have any kind of uh, sanity checking uh, checksumming of the final output file. So there are a number of large problems with, with the IPS format. And in this video, we're going to build an implementation of another patch format called BPS. And BPS is very much a successor to IPS. So let's zip over to the specification and take a look at it. Okay, so I have a copy of the specification open here. And I love this because the spec is just inside a markdown file. It's easy to have inside my editor while I'm implementing it. And what we can see here is it's the BPS file format specification, and it's by Near. Uh, and Near very graciously put this specification in the public domain, didn't use any other kind of licensing. I mean, that's the best way to make a format. Near uh, was an absolute giant in the emulation community, and worked especially uh, with the Super Nintendo emulation and created a lot of, well, a lot of what is the, the tooling and the actual emulators themselves, uh, some of the most accurate emulation of the Super Nintendo that exists. And that includes, you know, basically simulating the various pieces of hardware in the most accurate synchronized way as those pieces of hardware actually run at different timings and there's actually a lot of complexity when you try to emulate something that accurately uh, so near did a ton of research in this domain uh, of course worked on patch formats worked a whole bunch on communicating ideas about building emulators and strategies and balancing accuracy and yeah, so Nier is no longer with us. Um, I didn't know them personally, but I've always uh, been a big fan of both the code that they wrote and the, the, the communicative articles that they put out. And uh, yeah, so this is basically uh, a little shout out to Nier here. Uh, so thank you for creating this, this uh, patch format. Okay, so the reason that BPS is so much better than IPS is because it, in many ways, it was designed around sort of working around the problems of IPS. So straight away, what we can see is that it includes um, information about the size of both the file you're patching and the, the kind of the patched file that you will create. It includes the information about the upfront. So you don't need to worry about how many bytes you need to allocate. You know that if you're creating 
what this patch describes, you need to have a buffer of however many bytes. I mean, of course you don't actually have to do it that way, but the information is there so that you can. And at the end of the file, uh, you'll notice that in a very predictable place, as long as you know the size of this patch file, which of course you should, because you're just reading it, um, it you, can, you can scan to the, the end of the file and actually read these three UN32 numbers, and you can get a source checksum, so that's for the ROM. You can get a target checksum, so that is the checksum for the, the file that you create. And you can get a patch checksum, so you can actually check if the patch itself is valid. So this is great. This basically gives you all the validation you need up front to be able to actually see if everything is, is kind of is legit. So that's great. That's a huge improvement already. That's just like, you know, some guarantees about the, con the consistency of, of what you're going to get. Um, it allows for metadata to be included. So this is just arbitrarily sized metadata um, directly in the patch. So if you were, I don't know, if you were building a very specific emulator or if you're building a very specific tool that was also wanted to make use of something else, you, you know, this is something you could do. This is a method of extension um, to this format, which is actually uh, kind of version agnostic. This is the most kind of version agnostic way you could do to to extend the, the format because you can basically say, well, whatever, you know, if I'm extending this format and it's a certain version, uh, I'm going to put all that information in the metadata. And if you don't pass the metadata in the correct way, however, that's specified somewhere else, then uh, then that's not valid either. So it's a really smart thing to do to just add this kind of thing into your format. And then we get into the actual patching part. So these are the sort of patching actions that we had. So in IPS, there were really only kind of two forms of uh, encoding patch information. Um, they were really just one of them was a sort of piggybacking, uh, piggybacking on the first one a little bit, but it was essentially um, a way to encode run length encoding. So it was a kind of little bit of a compression in there, uh, optimized for a single byte. So if you have a run of a, a lot of zeros or ones or whatever, um, you can basically encode that in a in a in a smarter way, and the other one was to just basically read information out of the patch and place it on top of locations in the binary. So, oh, that's actually one of the bigger parts that I didn't mention about the drawbacks of IPS is that you also cannot. Um, there's no way to sort of insert data into the ROM, if that makes sense. So all you can do is sort of patch over bytes in the ROM themselves. And that is, I guess, the purest form of a patch. Um, but there's no sort of way of just saying, OK, I don't want you to overwrite what's in the ROM here. I want to inject stuff in between kind of what I just wrote and what I will take from the ROM later on. That's not possible in IPS. Um, OK, so there are four possible actions in BPS. So the first one is to just read bytes out of the uh, the ROM itself, the source. Um, really basic, basically like, hey, I've got a certain number of uh, bytes I want to read from the ROM, copy them into the target buffer. Pretty simple. Then we have something called target read. And in this case, um, we want to put new information into the stream. So we are encoding a certain number of bytes in the patch itself. So very much like IPS, just bytes inside the patch, and we're going to copy those into the target buffer. So those are two very simple operations. Then we get to two of the other operations that are possible, and these are a little bit more advanced, but actually allow for a lot more interesting encoding. So the first is source copy. So in this one, and actually both in source copy and target copy, which is the next action, both of these use a kind of different uh, keep track of a different uh, offset into the files. So both the, the source file itself, the ROM, and the target, the target buffer. And what these are, these are a kind of relative pointer inside those buffers that you can adjust according to uh, this number, which kind of says how many bytes you're going to be dealing with and which action you're going to use. 
And this allows you to basically copy data that is before in the target buffer. So you've written some data into the target buffer and uh, later on, you just want to point back to that old data you've already written and just write it again somewhere later on. Um, and the same thing is in the source here. So you've written some data from the ROM already, and now you want to write that data again, some of it. Uh, so maybe there are four, four bytes in the beginning here, you want to copy them in. Um, so that's actually really, it's a very smart scheme because it doesn't, um, it doesn't rely on just like byte for byte writing over patches. This actually allows you to go back, look, take some old stuff, look ahead in the file, put some things here. And that allows for some actual more advanced encryption. Uh, encryption, <laughs> absolutely not encryption, compression. Um, this actually is a much more um, advanced form of compression than what we see in uh, IPS. IPS basically just has run length encoding. Well, with this scheme, you can very much implement run length encoding, but you can actually implement more and more complex compression schemes on top of it. So we'll see how that works in a little bit, but that is the entire file. So once we've seen this, this is basically how a file is described in BPS. So we have a few extensions on terms. So we have source and target. I've already been over those. And number is used, and you can see it's used a bunch of times here. Number, number, number. Notice not in this case, UN32, that's a specific type, because number is a variable length integer encoding. And this is another one of the huge things that BPS brings to the table. Instead of having 24 bit numbers, for example, as you see in IPS, which are either a problem because you don't need that number of bits or because you need more. Um, so in the case that you have a small patch, you're always paying the cost of 24 bits when maybe you only need, I don't know, five bits each time. It would be a very small patch. Um, or you simply, there's no way for you to encode things that go beyond 24 bits. This gets around that. And so BPS has a specific way of encoding um, variable length integers. And these are kind of specifically um, in the base layer. They are uh, specifically uh, unsigned integers, but it also has a scheme for encoding uh, signed numbers as well. So that is something really interesting. And the next part is kind of talking about just how this thing can be used. So linear creation is one of the, the cornerstones of the format, and it's a really interesting one. So instead of um, a patch file that is simply a diff, that simply so kind of encodes the idea of, this is where there are differences between the old file and the new file, this format actually kind of almost forces you to describe the linear process of creating the file based on the source and the target. And this is really interesting because your file is, is much less a patch and, and, and more a description, a full description of how this file comes to be. And I think that's something quite interesting uh, in itself. So the variable length encoding scheme, we'll get to that. I love this in a spec as well. It also literally just drops in some some C or some C++. They, uh, Nia describes it here as uh, C++, but I mean, this is essentially C as well. Um, so, you know, if you're w wondering like, if one, you know, the idea of trying to figure it out, how it works is too complicated, you could just copy paste this in and adjust it to fit your implementation. But two, if you're just kind of trying to validate if you've written this correctly, you can always take your version, which may, because of how you write the files or how you deal with your buffers, maybe wouldn't fit exactly in this way. Um, you can just sanity check that you've written the right thing. So I, I love this in the spec. I love actually sort of dropping a little bit of code in for you. So this talks about the header, talks about the idea that there's a magic number, which is just EPS one. So we kind of got a version on there on the end, but there is only one version and I, 
I can't imagine that there will be a successor version uh, that wouldn't just be a new format at this point. Um, it describes that officially the metadata should be XML version 1.0 encoded in UTF. I mean, there's precision in one line, but it's actual, but it's what it says, there's no, um, it's entirely domain specific. So anything can go inside and the patch will be valid. So if you want to have a hundred percent compliant to the spec, uh, as in adhering to the line before, um, version of a BPS patch, whatever goes in the metadata should be XML, but can be anything. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I think that that's a very smart extension scheme. Uh, transfer lengths. This is something that if you've seen my video on Koi, uh, or my videos on Koi rather, you'll know that this is also done there. In Koi, anytime that you have a length of something, it is described as that length uh, minus one because you never need to actually store zero of something. Like that doesn't make sense. If you're talking about how to construct some piece of data you and you have zero of something, then you're not putting any information in by definition. So there's no real reason to have zero in your system. So you can use zero to mean one and you can mean, use one to mean two. So that's kind of just a very small optimization, but it removes ambiguity in the in the whole construction and stops there being kind of a ridiculous large patch that actually does nothing or kind of is trying to hide what it's doing that we don't have then we describe about the relative offsets so this is what i was talking about with these two um bottom actions as they're called here so the source copy and the target copy well in these cases, uh, what we have are relative pointers. We, we're keeping some state while we're building up this hole, uh, while we're passing the patch and applying the actions. So some of the state that we're including is like, what is the byte we're pointing to in the patch right now? So we're sort of moving through the patch, reading bytes out of it. Some of those bytes are gonna be commands. Some of them are gonna be telling us lengths. Some of them are gonna be like raw data. So we need a pointer or, or an index rather to, to just say where we are inside that buffer. Um, we also have an output offset and the output offset is the same thing, but inside the target buffer. So it's basically, you know, every time we want to write a byte to the sort of the patched ROM, um, we're sort of incrementing our output offset because we, we want to sort of write the, the first byte and then we want to move it along by write the second byte and so on. So we actually have two more offsets or two more indexes or pointers, however you want to refer to them. The spec calls them offsets, so probably I should call them offsets too. We have something called a source relative offset. And the idea is that the source relative offset is also um, tracking a position inside the ROM, but it's separate to the out, uh, it's separate to the, the uh, how do I say this? It's separate from the, the, the patch offset, if that makes sense. I don't think it makes too much sense, but I hope uh, I hope I'm getting through anyway. I think I'm just confusing myself at this point. The source relative, it's keeping track of where we are inside the uh, the ROM, but we can actually move this around. So we can basically add a relative amount to that, and then we'll move the pointer around, and we can move it back and forward and sort of read different parts at different times. So that's how we can sort of optimize the, the, the data that we need to encode in our patch, for example, because if it happens that you encode that the ROM itself already has kind of, you know, kind of little sections where you have the same data, three or four bytes here and there, you can actually sort of move the offset, read it out of the ROM instead of placing it into the patch directly. And then we have the target relative offset, which is the same thing, but in the target buffer. So when we've written something and we basically want to write that again, we can just move our target relative offset back a little bit and start uh, using a, a target copy command to, to output on one pointer, but to read from this other pointer. So we're moving these pointers along in tandem. And I will show this graphically in a little while. Um, maybe I'll show it right now just for this to make some sense. OK, 
Okay, so this is just a small example of what we have here. We've got the source, this is our ROM, we've got the target, this is our creation, and we have some bytes. And we have a pointer up here, which is basically saying where we are inside um, the target at any given time, sorry, the source. And we have a pointer here uh, of where we are in the target. So if we look at the actions, what we might first do, for example, is to perform a, a source read. So when we perform a source read, we might say, hey, I want to copy these four bytes into the target. So we would, uh, we would take those and we would copy those into our target. Now, of course, what that's going to do is that is going to move these pointers forward. So the next, the next byte we would push would be here uh, from the source. And the next byte we would write to the target, the output offset, if you will, would be here. Um, but now we can have something called a target relative offset. So let's take that. Whoop, let's take that and make a new, uh, a new kind of offset for ourselves, and we'll put it in a different color. This is our target relative offset. This starts at zero, and so what we might want to do now is to use a target copy command, and say we want to copy another uh, eight bytes. So how does that work? Because obviously we can't copy eight bytes because we only have four in here, but we're going to do it byte by byte. So what's going to happen is we're going to copy this byte to the output offset. Then we're going to move this offset forward by one and we're going to move this offset forward by one. And then we're going to do the same thing again. So we're going to copy this one and then we're going to write that, move the offsets along. And what you can see is that we're going to end up copying this original sequence one, two, three, four. We're going to copy it out two times. So we would imagine that after doing that a couple of times, we write one, two, three, four. And now we're actually at the point where we didn't have this data at the beginning, but now we're pointing at data that we've just written during the course of this command, and we're going to copy more of it. So what you can see is that this is a form of run length encoding itself, but we have a much more flexible run length encoding than we had in IPS, because in BPS, we can encode an actual run, not just a run of one byte, but a run of arbitrary number of bytes. And that's really powerful because you can, especially for certain kinds of data, this is a really, uh, a much more efficient way. If you have graphics data or you have audio data, you will often be able to copy segments around and have that be valid. That's, that's a very powerful tool for compression. Okay, so that is kind of how the run length encoding works. I hope that made some, some sense. Um, we go on to talk about repeats. Well, that's basically uh, what I just mentioned. Uh, or sorry, that's rather the fact that the the whole file is consisted of these four actions and you basically read action after action. And the idea is you read it until you have uh, 12 or less bytes left. Um, ideally, you should get to a point where you have just 12 bytes left. That would mean the file is valid because if we look here, the last uh, sort of, this is four bytes, four bytes and four bytes. Well, that, those last 12 bytes are your checksums. So if you happen to get to the end and you only have 11 bytes left, that means that the patch was probably not valid in the first place and you should actually abandon the whole uh, encoding um, procedure. But if you get to the end and you have 12 bytes, you know that actually you've done all the actions and now you can just read the checksums out. Or probably you would have read the checksums out before you applied the patches uh, because that makes more sense, then you can check the files ahead of time and you can know that you're done. So that is kind of the, <clears throat> the repeat section. And then it goes on to describe basically how the four commands work. So the source read, the target read, the source copy and the target copy. And I think what I want to do now is to just get into it, begin uh, writing some code and yeah, and actually get on with it. And we'll look at uh, kind of the specifics of those commands as we come to them. And now I say that, I do realize that we should look at the number format <laughs> before we get going. 
because that's going to be uh, immediately applicable. <clears throat> so I've made a little diagram here of the number format. So the idea is that we want to use the the most uh, the, the fewest number or the maximum possible number of bytes that we need to encode a number. And that number can be an offset or it can be a length. But in both cases, we want to be able to like efficiently encode the number in the fewest or most efficient number of bytes uh, without having an arbitrary limitation like 24 bits. So the way that that works in BPS is that you read one byte at a time. And so let's say this is your kind of your byte, your bit stream. You're going to read uh, the first byte, something like this. And what you do is you look at the, the most significant bit. And if that most significant bit is a one, that basically tells you that you this is the last part of this number. You don't need to read any more bytes. Um, so that is how we can basically say, do we keep are we done or do we keep reading bytes to make this number larger and larger? Okay, so that's that part. That part is indicating whether or not we have um, a, a, a byte coming after this. And then so those bottom seven bits, they are encoding the actual value that we have for this byte. So what we do is in this case, those bottom seven bits, they add up to one. Um, so we have one and we multiply it by uh, a, a number that we're keeping track of as we're reading these variable length numbers, which uh, the spec calls shift because it can be um, efficiently encoded as a shift operation. Although I think we'll do multiplication just to keep it uh, straightforward. I think seeing it from both angles maybe helps the understanding, but it doesn't really matter in the end. I think the compiler will work out the best way of doing this operation for us. So what we do is we start that um, that shift out <clears throat> or that multiplier, however you want to think of it, we, we start it at one. So basically we have the value one, we multiply it by one, and then we actually add on, uh, we actually increase the, uh, the shift, so to speak, we increase this number by uh, the value of the most significant bit. So by hex 80, and that's one shifted up by seven. And of course that makes sense, right? Because we're using seven bits here. And the next time we read another seven bits, like it's worth that much more, right? It's like if you have, uh, if you think of decimal numbers and you have uh, uh, like, you know, three, three places, the first place is worth everything from zero to nine. And the next place is, is like, you know, it's a magnitude up. It's worth everything from 10 up until 99. And then the third place is worth hundreds. So that's the same thing here, right? And because we're going up by seven positions each time, we're like, we're adding uh, this, this on. And the reason that we actually add this like we increase the shift, but we also add it uh, when we have more numbers to come is is kind of a consequence of this idea that we, the numbers, you never encode zero, right? You always add one to the thing. This is basically, it's kind of, you kind of need to play around with it to, to really come to grips with it. But this is basically encoding that. It's encoding this idea of like uh, getting to the right value in the end. So what we do is because we uh, we encode this value, we're not done. So we actually add on this offset, which is sort of the value of this bit, so to speak, if that makes sense. And then we go to the next. And so the next byte, we read this, we see, oh, we still have more bytes to come. We take the value of the bottom seven bits. In this case, it's 108. And we multiply it by one shifted up by seven. Now, in this case, we had, we just multiplied by one. Now we're uh, shifting up by one multiplied by seven, sorry, one shifted by seven. And that's because that's the value of shift at this stage. Every time uh, you move forward with shift, it gets moved up by seven bits. Um, and of course, because we're not done, now we need to add the new value of the, the shift. So that's now one shifted by 14, because in this case, we would when we were done with the this operation, we added this to the shift, and then we added it to this number. 
Now we've added another one shifted by seven to the shift, so it becomes one shifted by 14. And I see we're missing a bracket here. That's going to drive me crazy. Um, and then we're done with this part. So then we read the last byte and we see that we have a one. So we're done kind of uh, reading numbers. This is the last part of our number. So we take the value of the bottom, which is 112, and we shift it up by 14. <coughs> and then we don't add one shifted by 21, which is what we would do for the subsequent numbers because we're actually done. So the shift part like goes away once you're on the last part of the number. And what we do is with these, these values, however many we have, we can either add them together, like literally add, or we can all them together in a binary sense. And that will produce the same result. And that is our final number. That is the number that we can use as our variable length encoding. So it's probably kind of confusing. It confused me. Excuse me. It did confuse me when I first uh, read through the spec and I kind of had to play around in the debugger and just see how this was working for it to really click in place. So don't be surprised if that's the same for you. Just take the code, play around with it, put some breakpoints down, see how those values change as you read each byte. And I think it will make some sense in that, in that way. Um, but this is kind of how it is and this is what we're gonna implement. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my files here. It's uh, <laughs> we're however many minutes into the video and we're finally getting to write some code now, but it's good to know what you're doing before you actually go in. If I just said we're going to implement this uh, this spec and I didn't tell you what the spec was, that would, you know, you would kind of be in a, in a difficult place. So a couple of things about the code. I have some code files here already. Uh, there's a main file that contains basically nothing. It's got no code in the in the main program. It's got some constants here for the the ROM file that we're going to read, the patch file, and the output file. And I've got two includes up here, one for file X, which is kind of extended file operations that I uh, had in the previous video. And I'll follow up on some errata about that in a moment. I also have a CRC file. Uh, and that is because I've dropped in a uh, an implementation that I wrote of CRC32. And the reason I'm not gonna write this uh, during the whole thing is because it's kind of irrelevant. We can think of the CRC operation as a black box checksum operation for now. We don't need to go into that in detail, although I think it's super cool. Uh, if you're interested in learning about finite field arithmetic and Galois fields, then that is something we can do in the future. It's something that I think is really cool but it's kind of off topic for this video. So we're just gonna use it as a black box. I hope you don't mind that I've dropped in these 20 lines to implement CRC. Okay, so that is that. And the file X, well, I mentioned this before. Um, when I released the previous video, I got some, uh, some feedback uh, by someone who actually watched the video and also went off and wrote their own IPS patch. But they basically said, yeah, you've got a couple of, uh, you've got a, got a, a couple of uh, dodgy, um, checks that you really should be doing in here. And it was true. I was playing kind of fast and loose with the files. I just wanted to write functions that would would basically work knowing that the files existed as they were. But one of the things, for example, was that I was uh, not checking the output of FTEL. So if it happened to be uh, less than zero, and in this case, I can see that this is still wrong because this should be an in an int file size. Uh, so if the, you should check the value to the, of, of, uh, of file size to make sure that it's not negative. Um, and that's one thing. Uh, you should check the output of fseek to make sure that it's also not negative. And um, I had something where I was closing a, uh, closing a null file pointer, which was just stupid. That was just something that I made a mistake on there. But the other ones I was kind of just being a little bit loose with my my C, but you shouldn't do that. Always write things correctly. Never make any bugs, never make any mistakes. No, of course, that's not possible. But in this case, uh, I think it's worth it to also point out when things went wrong. So thank you for uh, pointing out those mistakes. Your name is passing me by. I think it began with S, but thank you for, for pointing those out. Um, okay, so 
let's get straight into it. I think the first thing I'm going to do, it's almost what I always do, is I'm going to start with the header file. I'm just going to call it bps.h. Uh, all the normal stuff. So if we haven't defined this marker bpsh, then define it and then end the define, end this if, and then that will make sure we don't copy paste the same header multiple times. And uh, what we're gonna do here is, I'm gonna take a slightly different approach this time. What I wanna do this time is to, um, is to create a structure that represents all of the state of the BPS operation. And in this way, it's kind of gonna be like, more like a class, uh, um, people think you can't write kind of classes in C. Well, you can't write them in the way that they do automatic dynamic dispatch and that kind of stuff. But you can very much create structures that contain all of the data about your operation. And then when you write functions, you just make sure that those functions always take as an argument uh, uh, a reference to that structure. And in that way, that that function will operate on the state and it will modify the state and it will return whatever it does. But in those cases, you're, you've basically written a method on a class. So that's the approach that I'm gonna use in this uh, this way. And I'm, I'm hoping that that will simplify things a little bit and maybe crystallize some ideas. So we'll start with a type def. Um, type def for a struct, we'll call it BPS state. And what will go into the state? Well, I think what we will do is uh, we will include file X. And the reason I want to include file X is because I want to use um, this ID, this idea of a sized pointer T which is basically a pointer to some bytes in memory along with a size. And that is just a useful, it's basically like telling you this is an array in every other language where you can introspect what the size of your array is. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just gonna, basically this is gonna live directly in this struct. So there's not a pointer to this information. It's just gonna live in the struct itself. And the first thing we'll call it the, <coughs> Well, let's try and use the terms that are in the, the spec. So we've got the source, we've got the target, and we've got the patch. So we're gonna have the patch. Uh, that's gonna be useful. We need to read bytes out of the patch. We're gonna have the source. And we'll also have one for the target. And we'll just keep all of those kind of directly here in memory. And remember that um, the, the actual data is going to be a pointer. So like the data doesn't live inside this structure directly. Like we're gonna be, you know, reading through it indirectly. So we've got the patch, the source and the target. And the spec tells us that of course, we're also going to have um, the output offset. So that's gonna be where we are writing bytes into the target. So output offset, I'm going to encode all of my um, numbers, even the variable width numbers, I'm going to encode them as UN64 because that is a huge number of, that is a huge space to encode for these bytes, right? That is more than enough. Um, if we have patches that go to UN128 or something, you know, it's not going to work in this, in this patch here, but it's also not going to be realistic because it's like, you are never going to have a file that is going to exceed the size of a UN64, at least not in this century. Um, oh, I mean, maybe in, in, yeah, maybe in this century, seeing the way things are going, but not certainly not on your laptop. So we'll call this the output offset. And we're going to also have uh, the patch offset. So we're going to have a patch offset. And we are going to have then a source relative offset and a target relative offset. So these ones are actually going to be signed. So they're gonna be int, well, that's not true. They're also gonna be UN64T. And um, also going to be, but actually I am gonna encode them as, uh, as integers. 
like signed integers, even though they are well technically only should take on signed values, uh, sorry, unsigned values, because this will make it easier to check if um, when we actually add relative offsets to this, if we add something that's like uh, going to push it behind like behind zero, if that makes sense. I want to be able to easily check if the number is less than zero, because of course, when you have you in integers and you 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 were sort of go beyond zero, you're going to wrap back around and it's not easy to check that. Uh, so we're not going to do that. We're going to have uh, signed numbers. And again, that does half the, the numerical space that we can encode values for, but still more than enough values. Um, okay. Uh, and I think that is going to probably be all the state we need. Um, might need to add something else there, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And I, the very first thing that's always nice to do is to just read uh, the magic number. And um, let's include also common.h so I can actually reference all of these valid, uh, these things correctly. I guess this already includes common, so don't need to do it. Could do it for just uh, making life easier to see where these things come from, but all of the functions will return bool. Uh, this is something we did basically as well in the previous um, IPS round. So all the functions will return bool, and this one will just be read magic. And the nice thing here is that pretty much always all we're going to do is take a pointer to our state. So this is the signature of the read magic function. And of course, what we're going to do there is read the four bytes out and check they're the right bytes. OK. Um, now we can create bps.c, where we will immediately include bps.h. And we will begin to implement this function. OK, so what we're going to do here? Well, this is pretty much what we did in the previous one. What we want to do in all of these functions is make sure that we have enough bytes to read a value. Um, so in this case, we need four bytes. And uh, the way we can do that is we can say if state, and then we've got our patch offset. If this is, while this is less than, well, while patch offset plus four is less than the state, uh, patch dot size uh, we're good basically but also uh, the easier way to check it is if it exceeds the size I guess if it's if it exceeds the size then we are then we're done right if our patch offset started at zero let's say we only had four bytes it starts at zero we add four and it's not greater than that size, then we can actually read those four bytes. Okay, that's good. Um, if we try to read five, it would be greater than, therefore invalid. And that, that is the boundary condition there, okay. Um, so uh, let's actually read and compare them. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to include uh, the string, string.h uh, set of functions, because then we can use string and compare, just like we did previously. And we're going to compare, um, uh, let's, I guess we can put it in here. Um, BPS, uh, BPS magic is the string BPS1. That's the BPS magic. So what we want to do is we want to check um, state uh, patch data at the state patch, uh, sorry, patch offset. We want to check that against BPS magic uh, with a max of four. And that's right, the pointers come first, then the size, and then we want to check that it's equal to zero. So that's how string compare works. It's a three-way string compare. So we get negative one uh, or one in the cases that um, the strings are not equal uh, in different ways. And we get zero when they are equal. So we'll just check for zero directly. 
So that's the first thing we can do. Let's actually already go into main and begin um, bps.h and we can begin like reading the files and uh, uh, checking the, the magic. So let's get the, we're going to have a sized pointer t, uh, size pointer t, no, we don't need to do this. We can, what we can do is create a BPS state T, call it state. And if we do uh, this, then this basically sets everything to zero in the beginning. Um, so we're going to have BPS state. And here we can say state dot patch equals read to end the patch file. And we want to read that in binary mode. And then we're going to read the ROM. Uh, it's not called ROM in this, we called it source. And so this is going to be, still leave it as ROM file here. And the patch, the source, and we're going to have a target, but the target is actually going to, we'll assign that in a moment. So let's now, um, this gives us back our size pointer t, we're assigning it here. So we can first, just before we do anything, I guess we can just print out some stuff. So we can see a red patch file and we'll just print how many bytes we got. And at this point you would also check that you didn't get a null pointer in either of these so that, um, uh, yeah, you know that you read something correctly, and if you didn't, then uh, that will be a problem. Um, I seem to have enabled this thing, which gives me uh, inline information uh, in the functions. I think that is because I set some Rust tooling up, and somehow the Rust tooling also, I think by mistake when I was messing around with things, I turned this on for C. Um, but it's actually quite useful, so I'm gonna leave it on. Um, then we read the, the source file and it was this many bytes. And let's just run this in the beginning and make sure it's legit. And then let's put the, the clean up at the end here. So we will do a, um, a free on the, do we have malloc around? I think, does something here include malloc? I think I put it in common. Yeah, I did. Which also means we don't need the string include in BPSC because it's already there. Um, Okay, so we're going to free state dot patch dot data, and we're going to free state dot source dot data. Okay, so let's run build. I guess I'm in. Uh, well, okay, so we've already got some problems here. I turned on more warnings, so this is actually a good thing. Um, this is a good, <laughs> a good thing to do. So we're printing, we're doing some print F here, and actually we're printing UN 64s. So we need to say that we're printing UN 64s. Um, uh, no return value on in BPSC. So oh yeah, that's true. We need to return false there, not just return. So already catching a whole bunch of stuff. Warning passing argument makes pointer from an integer without a cast. Uh, that's true. Again, I made this mistake in the previous one as well. We should actually be adding the offset and not indexing it in. So really great to turn all of these things on. And also it should take that. So I think if we run build again, um, this is a different type of pointer, which is true. So if we put that here and we basically cast this to the, the character pointer that it's expecting, I think we'll get rid of that as well. Um, and this cast is, is doable because we're just going from unsigned bytes into uh, character bytes, kind of signed character bytes. So that is a, a legal transition on the platform that we're doing here. All right, and I think if we run bin main, we'll see that we read the patch file, it has this many bytes and we read the source file and it has this many bytes. So that's a good sign already. Let's see if we can read the magic. Um, so if not BPS read magic and we're gonna pass in a pointer to our state there, then here we'll print F 
um, and we will say that uh, uh, invalid magic in patch file exiting and we will just return one there no need to free our uh, <laughs> No need to free our pointers down there because the operating system will do that as soon as we exit. Um, all right, so build bin main, and we didn't get an error, so that means that the magic is valid. And I've realised that I forgot to do something in here, and that is that we need to move the we need to move the patch forward. So let's just make this bool uh, return value. And well, in any case, I guess I guess we can just move. Now let's do it like this. I'm gonna move uh, state patch offset. We want to add four to that because we read four bytes, and then we want to return our return value. And it doesn't matter if the thing is valid or not. We'll just move it forward. But I don't want to mess around with uh, doing it before here and then adding four here. It's just not worth it. Um, yes, as well, we could also use uh, pointers here. So we could, instead of the patch offset being an offset, it could be a pointer into the, the buffer. We could do it that way. I'm not going to do it that way. So it, that's a, addressing that before it's asked. Um, so we read a valid magic. And what's the immediate next thing we need in the spec? Well, the next thing is going to be a variable length number for the source size. So let's actually implement that. Um, so we want to read an unsigned number at this point, an unsigned variable length number. And of course, I said that our unsigned variable length numbers are going to be UN64s. So let's also have our user pass in a UN64 pointer that we can write our result in. So I'll just call that value. OK, so we need BPSC again, so we can implement this function. OK, so how are we going to do this? Um, when we read an unsigned number, at every moment that we read a byte, we need to check if we have enough bytes to actually do that. So we can, uh, we're going to have a UNT64T, uh, I'm going to call it final, or uh, I'm going to call it result. It starts off at zero, and then in the end, we don't. We'll return true, of course. And before we return true, we will say that, uh, like writing to the value that pointed to by pointer uh, by value. <laughs> Too many words mixed together here. Writing through the pointer to value, we're going to write the result. So now to get to the result. We're going to go into a while loop, and I guess we can make it a while true loop until we figure out what the better way of encoding that condition is. And the first thing to do is going to be, do we have enough bytes to read? Like, can we read? So I'm going to copy this again, and we're going to say, if the patch offset, and we want to read one byte, so if the patch offset plus one um, doesn't, uh, or if it exceeds the size, that means we've gone off the end, we'll just return false. We'll, we'll leave the loop, we'll leave everything. <clears throat> okay, if we met the condition, we can move forward. We can assume that we can actually read that byte. So let's have, um, let's have a un8 t byte. Um, it doesn't matter what the value is in the beginning. And we'll say that byte equals uh, state patch data and then in this case we can actually we can address it sort of as an array and we'll increment our pointer as we do it so that's going to give us the byte so we have two th we have two parts right in this um oh we also need the the shift and i'm going to have the shift be a un64 as well actually i guess the shift does not need to be a un64 I'm going to call it the multiplier. Multiplier. I think I'm trying to remember what the spec calls it. The spec calls it shift, I think. Yeah, it calls it shift. They're both UN64. 
the data was also UN64, right? Yeah, called it result. Let's call it data as well. Um, we have a byte and we have a multiplier. We'll call it shift. Just stick a bit closer, but we're going to use it as a multiplier. So the first thing we want to do is to say that the data um, we're going to add to the data uh, this byte shifted up by shift or hmm what did we do the the, the multiplication part of it we just multiply yeah we'll we'll, sh we'll do the shifting part we went through it so i think it i think it's clear enough um we're adding the data shifted up by this amount and then what we want to do is uh we can't actually just take the byte because of course that most significant bit is uh is telling us whether or not there is more to come so what we need to do is to mask off the bottom seven bits and we can do that with uh, a masking with 7f, which is just 0 and then 7 ones. Um, and then we can actually check, like, hey, are we done? And we know we're done by checking that top bit. So if we end with ox80, that's going to tell us the if we are or not are not done. I guess if we're done, then we can break because we have finished doing what we're doing and then we immediately like write the value out of the data and then we we're done if we're not done that means there's more to come but we need to uh we need to both increase the the shift and we need to um add on uh hex 80 uh like multiplied by the shift i think if i'm getting this right um or we just add on the shift. So what we're doing in this case is um, we are saying shift uh, we're going to shift the, sh the shift by 7 bits and we are going to take the data and again add on I think we just add on shift at this point and let's go back to the spec to just double check that. So we're in the decode mode. So we read a UN8, we add it. Um, oh, they do a multiply by the shift. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, let's do the multiply as well to avoid disastrous consequences because multiplications and shift are not the same uh, directly. Although, yeah, that's not quite going to work out. So let's leave it as a multiply. Then we check if we're done we break we shift up by seven and then we add on the shift so i think we've we've pretty much got a one-on-one -on -one with what we have in the spec and then at the end we return the data and we return true now of course like you can see that like if every byte in the patch file somehow had a one in that bit like this is not going to work correctly but we're just going to rely on the idea that this is is done like at some point we we're not going to be able to read bytes anymore so we return false <coughs> otherwise we're just going to be creating we're going to be reading garbage and emitting garbage and that is you know a fair thing to do in these cases and of course we are already pushing the patch offset forward so i think this is good we can already try to read and this is a really good validation moment because we're going to we're going to read the sizes now of this file we're going to read the uh, the source size the target size and the source size at least we can validate against the file that we actually read so um i guess what we can do is we can have a uint 64t source size and that's just going to be uh start at zero and then we'll call this value we'll check its result to make sure that it went well we're going to pass in a pointer to our state and we're going to pass in a pointer to that source size variable that we met had so that it can write out to it and in this case if something went wrong then well uh, we'll say 
couldn't read uh, source size and then we will read the target size uh, couldn't read target size um, and then we will just print these out down here so print f uh, source size according to patch is ld bytes and same thing for target now let's run this so i'm going to build it i'm going to run it and what we got was red patch file <laughs> red source file source size according to patch zero bytes okay so this is a good moment to break out the um the debugger and let's just make sure that well let's just put a breakpoint down and launch the debugger and so here we are the patch offset is at four we're going to add one the patch size of course is much larger so that's not going to happen we're going to read the byte and so we've got the patch data and we've got the patch offset and we're reading that byte so the byte that we read in this case was zero um that does seem off something doesn't quite seem right here so uh let's see i would see that i'm previously looking at something like this so right now we were looking at patch offset four five becomes 127 I mean, this is also okay because uh, the value of zero is kind of a value of one. So maybe this is fine so far. Uh, we add the data, um, do that, increase the shift. So now we should have a shift of, oh, I set shift to zero in the beginning. That is the problem. There we go. Okay, so try this again, build, run. And the source size according to the patch is then 524288, and that does match the source size here, so that's great. And the target size that we create is an order of magnitude bigger at 2097152 bytes. Now we know how many bytes to allocate for our target buffer, because I am going to do all of this just in a in-memory buffer. Of course, you can do this just by streaming files, but I'm going to do it as an in-memory buffer because it's conceptually a simpler way. Okay, so what we will do now is we will create uh, we will create this uh, thing. So for the target size, I guess what we can do is we don't really need a variable for it. We could actually read into state uh, state target dot size and that's not a pointer but the whole thing should be a pointer so we're going to read into state target size and we can check that directly instead and we can validate that that is or isn't uh, large enough um, but now we can allocate the buffer for it um okay another thing i actually think might be uh useful to do is to actually read those crc values and validate way in the beginning like is this accurate so i might do that so to do that we can take a uint32 that's the size of this um crc and we know that there should be a crc for the source this will be uh, at the size minus four, this will be at the size minus eight, and this will be at the size minus 12. So this will be the source CRC. And we can get that by looking at state dot patch dot data, state dot patch dot size minus 12, and that is going to be a UN8. But I think what we want to do here is we want to. Okay, so now 
we're adding, this is a pointer, we're adding something to it. So it's still a pointer at this point. And I'm gonna, but it's a pointer to a uint eight. And what I wanna do is cast that to be a pointer to a uint 32, because what I wanna do is read four bytes at a time and not just read a single byte. So we can change the type of this pointer. So I'm gonna call it a uint 32 pointer now. And then I'm gonna read the value from that pointer with this indirection with the star. And so now what we should have is the CRC inside this, um, this byte here. And I'm just gonna put a breakpoint here. I'm just gonna run it in the editor and see if we get something realistic. Um, I guess it could be, uh, it's kind of hard to, to know. So uh, source CRC, yeah, because of course the CRC like value is just a, it's just a series of uh, numbers. So what we get in hex at least is B19ED489. Okay, it doesn't tell us much. So we'll let that go. And then what we can actually do is to, is to uh, digest like the actual uh, source file itself into a CRC and assert that they're the same. So we can say if, uh, source CRC is not equal to, and now I think I already have the CRC included here. So I have a function called CRC32 digest, and this function accepts <clears throat> a const pointer to some data. So that's gonna be state.source.data. And it also accepts a size. Well, that's just state.source.size. Now you see that why this sized pointer idea is such a useful thing because everything wants data and uh, a pointer and its size. So if these are not the same, <coughs> then we can also error out at this point. So we can say um, source CRC did not match and then we'll quit. So let's build and let's run. And we don't see an error message. so. The CRCs match. That's great. Um, I guess we could also check the the patch as well for validity. So the patch CRC. Uh, so that is going to be um, the very last, the four bytes at the end. And what we can do there is to. See so patch CRC did or did not match. So build, run. And it's telling us that they did not match. So that's actually kind of interesting. Um, I haven't looked too deeply into this. So maybe the spec describes something. Um, the idea is to allow the patcher to calculate the informa information as it's being produced. Well, that's, that is indeed a useful thing. We won't do it as we're producing, even though it is more efficient. Um, Finally, the patch itself has a checksum. The patch checksum is the checksum of every byte before it. So that actually makes sense. We shouldn't uh, read those last four bytes. And now it makes sense as to why the patch is, the patch checksum is the last thing, because now you can just say four bytes less than that. So if, um, if I subtract four from this, uh, we should see it passing. Hey, it passes. So that's great. Um, and finally, at some point we need to read the target, but there's no point in reading the CRC target for that right now because we don't have, we can't compare the bytes. So we've done what we can for now. Let's actually create the target buffer. We've already read the size into the state target. So let's actually say state.target.data is gonna be a call to malloc and we wanna allocate uh, state.target.size bytes. Okay, we're gonna assume that allocation worked in this. Uh, of course, you should check that. Uh, I'm not gonna do it here. And we're going to free uh, state.target.data at the end. Okay, so allocate the target buffer. Okay, so now we can actually start reading commands because we have, oh no, we can't, we need to read metadata. 
So the next thing to do is to read metadata size and then any metadata that comes after it. We're just going to ignore all of that stuff. So what we can do is we can say um, uint 64 t metadata size is zero. Then we are going to do a BPS read unsigned. Uh, we're going to pass in our state. We're going to pass in our metadata size variable. Uh, I guess we can always check. It's funny because I'm not checking things like the malloc where I really should be, and I'm always checking the, the BPS. But, uh, you know, take your own conclusions from this. <laughs> I get, I, I get, I'm going to check the malloc now. So if state.target.data, if it's null, then uh, allocating target buffer failed. Okay. Um, So this is kind of a thing where it'd be nice to kind of have a macro for all of this. So you don't have to, uh, so you don't have to have error out in this way. This is a very common problem uh, in C and actually a lot of other languages that also have things like optionals and that kind of stuff. It's kind of like, um, The whole idea of having an optional type is that you want to defer like all the error handling to the end. It would be really nice if we could do that, but then often you know you you have your function you want to exit early. So fine, all of that stuff. Um, so target size metadata, <coughs> and then we're gonna just simply move uh, the state patch offset forward by whatever we read out of the metadata size because we're ignoring metadata. Um, I guess we can print it at this point, like the size of the metadata. But we're not going to do anything with it. And I'm pretty sure it is... Um, I'm pretty sure it is zero anyway, so let's just build run. Uh, it was zero bytes, so we didn't uh, <laughs> didn't have any metadata to speak of. Now we're actually in the handling of actions. So, um, okay, when we're reading actions, there's kind of two things we need to do that you can see. We first need to read a number and that number then has a, a specific thing inside it. So the it has an action, and this is kind of you need to read this as if it is an uh, a bitwise or operation. So it's not like the order of bits here. We're reading like as if it we already had these values that are kind of derived from this number, and we're putting them in back into the variable length number. So in the bottom bits we have an action. And then every uh, every bit left, so that's why it's shifted by two, because actions take up two bits, because we have four actions, right? You only need two bits to store four numbers. Um, the rest is the length minus one. So I think what we're going to do is, and of course, remember, it's length minus one, because we don't include zero. We assume that there's no zero lengths in this thing, so zero... Uh, sorry, if we had, um, like, what would we have here? We would have a length of zero. Oh, this is when you're encoding it, of course. So then it's minus one. But what we are just, uh, if we read it out, we need to uh, add one to it. Um, okay, so I actually want to put this inside a function. So I think what we're going to do is... Um, I'm going to make another type, type def, and we're going to call this a BPS. I'm going to call it an action, and it's a struct, of course. 
again, structs just basically what you would think of as objects in uh, in in languages like JavaScript. Um, so, or, or or types in TypeScript, you know, <laughs> it's also literally just a definition of a type. Very familiar if you're familiar with TypeScript. Um, okay, what's going to go in here? Well, of course, two things. Um, uh, I'm going to use an enum here as well. So I'm going to create a, an enum, and this is going to be a BPS uh, a BPS action type. Um, so we've got four actions. Uh, we've got source read, source target, source copy, and target copy. So let's just take these four bring them in here. Those are our four actions. And I'm going to prefix these because they just, these names get thrown into the global namespace. And I'm going to prefix them with BPS action. So it's BPS action source read, because then, you know, we can see where it came from. Action type, I guess, since I called it action type. That lets us know where this came from. Um, okay, so now we don't need to have u in 8. We can say we have a BPS action type T, and this will be the type. And then we are going to have uh, a length, and that's going to be a u in 64, because that is our variable length. So length. I'm just packing these things together because I think it will be more useful to do that. Um, okay, so we'll have bool bps read action we'll take in the state and we'll take in a pointer to an action which will you know will allow the caller of this function to uh to, to figure that stuff out so let's implement this function Okay, so the idea is that we're going to read a number. So uint64t, I guess we can read into the, uh, can we read into the action though? Let's do it as a, take uint64 here. Uh, so we call it value. And then we will read an unsigned into that number. So we're going to take the state. We don't need to do anything here because state is already a pointer. And then we want to pass in value. If this didn't succeed, we're simply going to return false, right? Um, we need to be able to read a number. And so we don't need to do anything more than that. If we get past this point, we have a number. So we can say that the action uh, type, well, that's going to be, um, the value that we just read and only the bottom three bits of it and the bottom three bits can be uh, sorry the bottom two bits and that's represented by the number three <clears throat> because one plus two is three and one and two are both powers of two um, and then to get the length now of course keep in mind by the way that uh, like even though this is a BPS action type T uh, it's an enum value, like we're just throwing in, uh, <laughs> we're literally throwing in uh, an integer here. And we know that the integer is constrained to the the size of that enum, but nothing is guaranteeing that, right? So um, this is just, C is loose with types. This is something you can do. You could, you could definitely make a situation where the thing you put in the enum is not valid, but um, that is... Uh, well, that's one of the, the fast and loose parts of C. So for the rest of the value, we just want to take that value and we want to just shift it down by two bits, right? Because um, those two bits take up the type. We just want to get rid of them. Uh, and value is an unsigned type. So we're not going to be sign extending. We're just going to be zero extending. So we'll just get the right value out of this. Okay, and then we're done with it. So in the end, we just return true. So that's how we read an action. Um, so I guess what we can do here is we can just like get into a while loop. And the while loop that we're going to have is 
checking that state dot output offset is while this is less than um, while this is less than state dot patch dot size minus 12 because those last 12 bytes represent the CRCs like while we're still reading stuff out basically uh, we're gonna be in this loop so let's give ourselves uh, a BPS action T out here that we can write into. Because the first thing we're going to want to do is to say if not BPS read action, we could pass in our state and we are going to pass in our action. So if this didn't succeed, uh, We'll just say fail to read action. And I guess if we hit something like this, we'll put in some more debugging information. But for now, that would probably be enough. So here we read out our action. And now we need to basically switch on its type. So what was the action type? And there are four possibilities for this. So. The first case is that it was a BPS action type source copy, uh, source read rather. That's number one, uh, yeah, number zero in this case. Then we have the case that it was a target copy, which is when we read from the patch. Then we have the case that it is a a source copy, which is when we uh, move our relative pointer and then we have the target copy okay so the source read that's the most straightforward one uh, i actually just want to see if we're able to read this action and how it looks like what is the first action so i'm gonna launch gdb here and the action that we got is that it's a source read, so that's great, we can check that, and it's of length 481. Now that actually seems pretty reasonable because the first thing that we wanna do when we're reading is just sort of like take the existing stuff out of the ROM and then only later on at some point are we gonna start changing things. And it makes sense that in a lot of cases, the first few bytes of the ROM probably aren't gonna change. That's gonna be like really, could be just really essential stuff. Um, so that seems pretty reasonable to me, just to, on like a getting a feel for it kind of idea. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement a function for each of these. Um, and that function can fail and we can check for uh, this thing. So let's start with, um, let's have, again, those four names. Let's do this a bit programmatically. And in all of these cases, it's a BPS state T pointer to state. And I don't think we need anything else from those. So that's kind of how we can do that. And then we can implement those functions in BPSC. Let's give them all a real valid implementation in the beginning, and then we'll start with source read. So what we're gonna do here is we are going to read Oh, we need the action in all of these cases, or at least we need the length. Yeah, so let's uh, pass in a UN64T length. Um, and let's make sure that we fix that in the signatures as well. Yep. Um, so we want to make sure that we have enough bytes left in the ROM. So that's we've been doing this again and again and again. Um, basically, what we're going to say is if the state, uh, and this is going to be the, we're reading from the ROM. And we have the output offset. I think the output offset and the ROM offset, they do actually stay in the same 
they stay in the same place and the reason is like they they stay in sync but you can always use the source relative and the target relative to inject things in between and that's kind of the injection mechanism so that's kind of how they get past it i think what we need to do is to check the output offset here and we need to say that if the output offset plus the length exceeds the size of the source then we return false so in that case we couldn't read okay but in the case that we can this is just the most straightforward of reads and i'm thinking that i probably don't really want to get fancy with it and all of I'll leave these as having all the same kind of structure so I'm actually just going to use a while loop here <clears throat> and we'll just say while the length is greater than zero um, and we're, so I'm going to decrease the length here this argument is passed on the stack it's not pointer so there's none of that kind of stuff we don't have to worry about that we can modify it uh, it doesn't have to be const um, while the length is greater than zero, well, what we're going to do is to, we're writing into the target. So we have state target data, <coughs> and we're going to write at the output offset. So that's going to be state or output offset. And that's just going to equal uh, uh, reading from the source because that's what we're doing at this point. So we're reading from the reading from the same position into the target from the source and then the state uh, output offset is being increased by one. And at the same time, each time we wanna take one away from length. So we can actually do that here by doing a post fix, which basically means that when we do this comparison, it's first going to check the comparison, then after it does it, it's going to decrement length. So we're always going to check the length first. <clears throat> so, okay, that actually looks like the right implementation of source read. Um, so then we're going to do target read. And I guess it's going to be kind of similar enough that I'm going to just copy and paste it here. In target read, we read out of the patch file. So here we're going to have the patch offset. So we need to have enough in the patch to be able to do this. Um, and actually, really, we should be checking patch size minus 12 because we shouldn't really be reading. Uh, we shouldn't really be reading into the CRCs. I guess it's legal. I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to. Um, actually, what does the spec say about that? Let's actually check because this is a good spec. I think they'll they'll mention it. So when we read from the target, um, it, new data is created. This uh, It stores said data in the patch. This time the actual data is not available to the patch applier, so it must be stored directly in the patch. Okay, it doesn't mention it, but in that case, since it's not explicit, I'm going to assume that we can um, that we can just check the whole patch size. That's fine. Um, so now we're reading out of the patch using the patch offset and going to the output offset. So the nice thing we can do here is we can get rid of this line and both of these will be just incremented as we go. Super straightforward. <coughs> Source copy. This is where things get nice and interesting. Um, so in this case, um, if we go back to the spec, uh, in this case what we have is is that i'm pretty sure that the the length is going to no that's not true the first thing we're going to do is read a number and then from that number we're going to extract if it's a negative number and we're going to figure that whole that whole thing out so the way to do that is, first of all, let's read a number. So, um, actually, you know, I'm kind of interested as well to, to take a look at what is done here and just check that this is part, 
is this part of the length or not? Okay, so decode is a call into read and unsigned in this uh, spec. So we're going to read and unsigned. That is going to move the whole patch forward itself. So we don't need to worry about that. Okay. So what we're going to do here is check if we can read this number first. So first of all, we're going to have a uint 64 t <coughs> And this is going to be the, uh, what do we call this? Because in the end, we're going to need to, um, da, 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 da. I'm going to call it the, I'm going to call it the offset. It's a terrible name, but it's, that's what I'm going to go with. Um, so we need to read an unsigned. And then what we do is we take the state and we have this source relative offset. And we're going to set the source relative offset to be uh, kind of the number we decode out of this. So how are negative numbers encoded in this spec? Well, it's quite straightforward. Basically, uh, in the bottom bit, we have whether the number is negative or not. So this is kind of opposite to what you would know in uh, in in other number formats like two's complement, although it's equivalent. Is that the top the in two's complement the most significant bit usually tells you whether something is a negative or not. In this case, it's the least significant bit is telling us if it's negative. Um, so that is our kind of specifier for that, and then the rest of the number is an absolute offset. So basically if um so it's not like two's complement in this way that once you have the sign bit that the whole number becomes different this is more like a one's complement uh where <clears throat> you include an absolute version of the number but one of the bits tells you whether or not it is um uh, signed or unsigned um so what we're going to do is basically exactly this <laughs> we are going to say that if uh, offset and with one, which gives us if this is a zero or a one. If it's a one, um, <coughs> this means that the number is negative. So we're going to have a minus one because we're going to use this as a multiplier. So this is going to be a minus one. Otherwise, we're going to have one. And then we're going to multiply that by um, the offset shifted down by one because that is going to get rid of that uh, that uh, that bit that we had. And that's it. Basically, the offset at that point is going to be a, uh, a positive number, and we're going to multiply it by a negative number potentially here. And in the end, that goes into our int64 source relative offset. OK, so at this point, what we need to check is is the source relative offset less than zero? Because if it is, then that's just invalid and we're done. So if the source relative offset is less than zero, return false. Now we also want to check if uh, the source relative offset plus the length is within bounds. Like, is this within the bounds of what we can read from the source, which is the ROM? So if this is greater than um uh, not this <laughs> essentially this but not this in the terms of this language um i guess we could have called this this but uh, no i'm not going to do that uh if it's less than the source size then or sorry if it's greater than the source size then we're also uh considering that to be bad and finally, we also need to check that the amount of the length that we're writing into the output, into the target, is still less. So we actually need to check a whole bunch of stuff here. So state, um, and this is going to be <clears throat> output offset, because we're always writing to the output offset. If the output offset plus the length exceeds the target size, then we're done too. So we have three conditions of failure here. One where this source relative offset goes be behind zero. 
<coughs> that actually doesn't really make sense in this case. Um, or does it? I think what I'm missing here is that this always starts at zero and each of these is is modifying the previous offset. So we need to add to it. I'm just going to validate that quickly because that is pretty important. Yeah, okay, so we're always adding to this, right? That makes sense. And also they called this data. So I'm also going to call it data. That makes more sense. Okay, so in the first case, if this ends up being now less than zero, that's a failure. If this offset plus length exceeds the size of the source, we can't read from beyond the source, of course, then that's a failure. And if, like the place that we're actually going to write to, if that plus the length is greater than the size of the, the total size of the output buffer, that's also a failure. So those are our three conditions of failure. Um, now that we have them, we can actually write our loop. So while length, it's the same kind of loop, one length minus one is greater than zero. Not minus one, minus minus. Um, we're going to do something like this. We're going to read out of the source uh, using our source relative offset, which we're going to increment. And we're going to be writing into the target using the output offset. Okay, that looks about right. The final part is the target copy, which is going to be in many ways very similar to this one. So let's see if we can start it out in the same way. The only real difference is that instead of reading from the source, now we're going to be reading from the target and writing into the target. So it's kind of a tricky point from that perspective. So the target relative offset adds the same, uh, same situation. That also cannot go beyond zero, uh, like less than zero. It cannot exceed the size of the target because that's where we're reading from. And finally, the output offset, which we're going to also be using to write back into the target buffer, that also cannot uh, exceed. So in that case, that's also the same here. And we need to be reading from the target, Whoop. from the target back into the target. And now you can really see how you get this nice run length encoding. If you want to repeat the same byte, you write the byte once using uh, target, uh, sorry, using source read or target read. It doesn't matter. You, you, you somehow get from, uh, sorry, using target read. Yeah, you read one byte out of the patch, you place it into the target, and then you can do a target copy where you say that your length is 64 and your target relative offset is just minus one. So you go back uh, behind uh, your uh, the thing you just wrote, or you, you figure out whatever your offset has to be for that. And then you just write the same thing out 64. And since you have these two uh, pointers essentially at different parts of the target data, and they're constantly in tandem, the target relative offset and the output offset, you just keep copying the same data again and again and again. So really smart. Uh, that Those are our four implementations for those functions. I'm sure I wrote bugs into that. So <clears throat> I guess what we're going to do here is uh, just in each of these things, um, I guess I can try and do this in a multi-line way. So we'll take those in each of these cases. Well, something's not quite right there. It's going to get messed up. So uh, in each of these cases, if EPS underscore source read, we pass in a reference to the state and we pass in action dot length. And if we failed to do that, then we will simply printf uh, source read failed. For now, I'm just going to do it like this. Like I'm not going to put any more information and then we'll return. Return errors in all those scenarios. Uh, but in each of these cases, um, 
we should be at that point. And then finally, uh, we will get to the last 12 bytes will be done. We'll have filled, we'll have uh, done all of our actions. Um, and then we will have our target buffer. And what I want to see at this point is I want to see just like when we run this, do we do we hit this breakpoint? Because if we hit the breakpoint and there are no other problems, then that's probably a good sign. And I'll continue on with the CRC. Maybe we'll just do the CRC check at this point. So to get the CRC, uh, let's just copy this piece of code. So this is gonna be the target CRC. The target CRC is uh, eight bytes back from the end. So this is four bytes back, this is eight. And then what we can do is to check the target CRC against the target data and the target size. I think we can check the entire target and the target CRC did not match. So I'm actually gonna just run this now and I'm sure that we're going to see something wrong. Like, it would be crazy to me if this went well on the first try. Target CRC did not match. So that's not great. But at the same time, we did get through the while loop and nothing blew up. So I wonder what went wrong here. Let's see if there's anything special about the target CRC. I don't think there is. Um, and then the target output off. You know what I think? I may have made a mistake here. Yes, I've I've switched these around for all of them. <laughs> okay, in this case, target output, source output. That's correct. Um, when we're reading from the source, we're writing in. We're always writing into the target. So. Uh, this makes no sense. <laughs> so when we're reading from the target, we are always, we're always writing into the target and we're reading from the patch. We are writing into the target and we're reading from the source. And here we're writing into the target and we're reading from the target. But the problem uh, also for these ones is that it needs to use the output. So this, we're using the patch offset here. That should be on this side. This should be the output offset here. Uh, same thing here, source relative is there. Output offset comes to this side and target relative. Okay. That was a pretty fundamental error. So target CRC did not match. So again, uh, mess something up here. So um, let's see, uh, in a source read, we are reading into the target using the output offset from the source using the output offset. I believe that's correct. Uh, so that is from source read and indeed same output increase the output okay in target read we are reading into the target at the output offset and we are reading from the patch itself at the patch offset so how does the spec here okay they just say read as in read a byte and then somewhere behind the scenes they have something which is incrementing the patch offset because you may implement this with a file you may implement it with a buffer so they don't specify it here <coughs> but we can assume that that one looks correct too so source copy is when we are reading from the rom using the source relative offset and we are reading into the target at the output offset. So this looks right to me at a glance. Uh, we're reading some data. We calculate the offset, which is uh, minus one in the case of there being a one in the data and then shifting the data down by one. So we are having a minus one offset. 
we're shifting the data down by one. That looks good. We've got these conditions in here, um, which are uh, implicit in the spec, but I'm placed in explicitly. Uh, reading from the target, uh, sorry, reading into the target from the source using the source relative offset. That seems about right. And lastly, in the target copy, same thing, same set of conditions, reading into the target using the target relative offset. So that's interesting. Am I missing something else here? Um, target CRC. Uh, target CRC. Okay, that's 9AE. And then I wonder if I can actually put this function call in. I think this probably won't work. Oh, it did work. Uh, so it is it is a different uh, output. Hmm. Maybe it's worth running this through and making sure that this is actually working. Well, this is less than match size. So the first thing we were doing was a source read. I guess let's follow it in and just see what happens. So we check if we have enough bytes. Output offset is at zero. The length is 481. Uh, we have enough bytes for that. So we copy out the byte. That seems fine to me. So I'm going to accept that. Um, now the output offset should be 481. So that's correct. It was successful. We break, we go to the next round. Um, we are reading an action, and this time apparently we have a target read. Uh, so we're reading something out of the patch this time. We're reading three bytes out of the patch. Uh, we're going to check, do we have enough bytes for that in the patch? Then we're going to write the output from the patch. That also seems fine. I think what I'll do is I'll put a breakpoint down in these two. Take this one out. So first we get to a target copy. So the target relative offset ends up being 62. So we're reading into the target buffer at 62. Um, presumably the output offset is way beyond that. The output offset is 484. Okay, so this was just the next uh, instruction. Um, target relative offset is greater than zero. We have enough bytes left in the target for this, so that's fine. And the output has enough target, uh, output offset is has enough bytes left. So we're reading into the target from the target at this and we're going to write into this. So hmm, something went wrong there. I think I clicked one too many times. I don't quite know what happened. Um, okay, so that was a target copy. Let's see if we get any source copies. We do. And this is when we're at quite a bit further along. So we are going to read the source relative offset. It's now 2601. Seems fine. Uh, we check that it's not less than zero. We check that the length doesn't go beyond the size. It does not. We check that the output does not go. And then we're reading into the target at the output offset from the source of the source relative offset. Okay, we're only reading three. We 
get to the end and the target is failing the CRC. So that's interesting. Um, hmm. Am I definitely reading from the right place? The target checksum is eight back from that point. Um, okay. Now I'm interested to see if this patch just plays, because if it plays and this somehow this CRC is wrong, well, that could happen, I guess. That could be the case that whoever made this patch didn't didn't actually take the time to uh, CRC the final output. Um, that would be pretty bad if that was the case. But let's just write this out to a file and try and play the patched game. So we can grab ourselves a file star called f and f open uh, the uh, what do we call this target file for writing a binary file and we are going to f write um, now the arguments for this one we're writing from state dot target <coughs> dot data we are writing state dot target dot size bytes we're writing that one time and we are using the f file pointer that we have and then we need to f close f And then let's, uh, let's try that out. So we're going to build it. We're going to run it. Um, so we have a file now. Uh, that is going to be in the ROM section. It's called patched. And let's switch over to an emulator. I've got a different emulator open this time. I'm hoping that this will work a little better. Um, and need to go into bps patch roms patched and i'm pretty sure this happened last time as well i need to restart this program <laughs> so that should be back open open the system cartridge slot now we have patched and let's power on And it looks like this is not valid. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, well, that kind of, I guess that asserts the, the same thing as the CRC. So why did that not work then? All right, so I'm actually here from the future, not too far in the future, but uh, the future nonetheless. And after I sort of hit this problem with the CRC check, um, I tried to debug for a little while, but after after some time, I realized the video was going to get really long if I left all of this in. And so I kind of stopped it there and uh, went away and sort of thought about it for a bit and then came back and figured out the problem. And as is usually the case, there was more than one problem, uh, more than one bug. Uh, so let's actually just take a, a quick dive in and fix those bugs and see if we can't get this running. So the first bug, the most important one, so to speak. I mean, all bugs are equally important uh, if they stop your program from running. But kind of the biggest flaw here was in this line. So essentially, uh, this loop is supposedly <clears throat> reading through the patch. And while we are not at the end of the patch, while we have like a few bytes left to read, um, we should be in this loop. But we're looking at the output offset. And we use the output offset to read from the ROM and to write to the target. So this is wrong. If we replace this with patch offset, then actually it will work correctly. So the problem was actually that we weren't reading all of the actions of the patch. We were getting to kind of the end of this condition, but we hadn't executed all of the, the actions and therefore we were never going to CRC check correctly. There is an additional problem and that is if we come over to the BPS file and we look at this read action, um, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this as we were reading the spec, but this number, 
would be correct if we could represent zero in the system. And since we can't represent zero in any lengths, this is wrong and it's off by one. So we need to add one to this whole thing. So these were the two big bugs of the thing. There are actually a couple more. They're not quite as bad. I mean, they are bad more in the case of for invalid patches. But in this case, we check if the if we have enough to read out of the patch, but we don't check if we have enough space to write into the target. And that is actually quite important. So we should check if the output offset plus length is is still in range for the target. So that's quite important to do. Uh, and we have the same bug here in um, source read. Here we're uh, checking the output offset, output offset against the source, but we also need to check it from the target perspective. <clears throat> and if both of those pass, then we know we're good. But if either of them fail, then actually we're, we're not in a valid state. Um, and for the rest, I'm pretty sure that uh, these ones are taken correctly. So these will stay in place. Okay, with that, let's actually um, just run the program till here and make sure that the CRC check passes. Uh, because if it doesn't pass at this point, then I think I'm just going to give up on the video. Uh, we pass. That's great. Uh, so we pass the CRC and eventually it writes the file. I'm not going to write out the nice uh, script flow. I might do that after before I push the code to GitHub because I do think it's nice to see that kind of output. Um, and now we should just be able to check it out in the emulator. So I'm going to switch the emulator view. I know that there is a bug in this emulator or at least in the Linux version of it that if I come to load a ROM um, from the directory, so we're going to have the patched. OK, so when I come to load this ROM, <clears throat> I can't interact with the UI anymore. I need to reboot, reload the program. And now we can actually select the patched uh, cartridge and we should be able to power it on. And l would you look at that? So this is the, the superstar patched uh, Super Mario World. I haven't actually played this. I don't even know how the controls of this emulator work. So it's very likely that I can't even input anything. But we can see that we have indeed patched the ROM. It works correctly. All the CRC checks pass. And we have interpreted the BPS format correctly. So I'm considering that to be a success. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for bearing with me through the, through the bugs and through walking through this binary format. I've really enjoyed going into these patch formats. I may look into some more in the future. But I think I'm, I'm quite happy with the comparison between IPS and BPS. I think that's, that already tells a lot about um, kind of the evolution of this sort of microcosm of, uh, of sort of computer science and enthusiasm for a certain hobby. Now, we wrote both of these programs in C. I think in the future, of course, we are going to use some other programming languages. So if we do visit another kind of uh, format like this, then I'll probably write in something else. Um, and then we'll get another perspective on different kind of programming language and environment and approach. And hopefully it can draw some kind of comparisons there too. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.